Americas. Remember, the Americas are going to be left out of um, the world history train for a very long time, as Europe and Africa and Asia are always interconnected by the Silk Road or Mediterranean trade routes. What was going on in the Americas? And it's not like nothing was going on over here. The fact is that the Americas were disconnected. The early inhabitants are going to follow herds of game over the ice bridge in the ice age that we know as the Bering Strait. Remember, how do we know that? We take our bearings and we go straight. We got over here and slowly over a long, long, long period of time, they began to migrate down through Canada, down the American West Coast, over the Rocky Mountains, Great Plains, the, the, the Sahara, um, or the Southwestern Desert, all the way to Tierra del Fuego. So while other cultures were forming Neolithic villages and civilizations, in America, we were still dispersing. The Ameri Native Americans were still dispersing. And when the land bridge melts, when the Ice Age ends, that connection between North America and Asia is broken. So people in North America are going to evolve on their own. They will be relatively untouched until the conquistadors in 1500. So in the Americas, the civilizations are going to do the same things as everybody else. They're just going to be 1,500 to 2,000 years behind. So when everybody else is forming civilization in Egypt and Mesopotamian India and China, the Americans are just settling in villages. So starting from East Africa, the diaspora of people over the land bridge, all the way on down. And man, it takes forever. And this little white line here is the outline of all the glaciers during the Ice Age. We don't need to know that. So it's funny if you look at cave paintings in the American Southwest, they look very similar to cave paintings over in Mongolia. Um, the word for house is the same, kind of symbolizing this migratory pattern over here, and they kind of line up on a latitude line. All right, anyway. So after the Bering Strait melts, American civilization is going to start forming villages between 5,000 and 2,500 BC. Everyone else is in cities. All right? This same process began in Europe, Africa, and Asia around 10,000 BC. This is how they are going to remain in those isolated little empires until the Spanish show up all right, 7,000, 8,000 years later. In separate cultures, separate distinct Indian cultures begin around 1500 BC, where we see different types of civilization growing. Now keep in mind, everything that people in the Americas are going to do is done on the backs of pure human labor. The Americas, we do not have large beasts of burden, no oxen, no horses. Everything's done by pure muscle power because in the Americas, we have absolutely no access to cultural diffusion. Everybody else gets access to the Indian Ocean, Silk Road. The Americas come up with it on their own. Am I going too fast, too slow? Roll it. All right. First civilization in North America and Mesoamerica are going to be the Olmecs. How do we remember them? Because the Olmecs come from old Mexico. Thank you, Aaron. You paid attention either last year or this year. Old Mexico. Happened down in old Mexico like the Toby Keith song. They developed between 1500 and 400 B.C. So this is right about the time 
of the Trojan War, right about the time that the civilization of ancient Greece is reaching its high point. So the Olmecs are a classical age civilization simultaneous with ancient Greece. And they will form two very distinct cities, San Lorenzo and Levanta. What is strange is they weren't simultaneous. San Lorenzo was at its height in power, and as it began to decline, Laventa rose. So think of like people leaving Detroit, which was San Lorenzo, they moved to Atlanta, and Atlanta becomes a major city. One declined, the other one got big. Their achievements, they will build a 110 foot tall pyramid in Mesoamerica, no matter where we are, there is going to be a pyramid of the sun and a pyramid of the moon. Everybody is polytheistic, the gods of nature. They also dug elaborate drainage canals out of the mountains to bring water to their crops. And they stored <coughs> water in these giant like ceramic ponds that they could like drain and keep the water flowing to keep it fresh constantly. It didn't stagnate, it didn't get bacteria. They kept it moving the whole time. Um, very similar to the other River Valley civilizations they were dominated by priest kings, someone who could control the forces of nature. And by looking around at some of the artifacts that had been dispersed throughout the area, we know the Olmecs were somehow um, linked to an ancient trade route of some way, shape, and or um, form. So, um, on, the Medi or on the Mediterranean coast, on the Gulf Coast, and inland. And they are the first to worship the part man, part jaguar deity. That will be, or, um, resemble, um, or show up in all Mesoamerican civilizations, kind of the Mesoamerican version of the Sphinx, which was part man and part lion. Next, we go to a standalone regional culture known as Monte Alban. And Monte Alban um, comes to power right around 500 BC. Monte Alban you can link up with in Rome, ancient Rome. And they will become the first people in Mesoamerica that will start the trend of sacrificing prisoners of war. Human sacrifice is nowhere is it bigger than in Mesoamerica. It would somehow please the gods. If things got really bad, the nobles would actually let their, would cut their own um, veins or even sacrifice themselves because they felt that their blood was more important. Now, they will develop a calendar, their technology, that has two interlocking rings. One is um, a calendar of the sun. The other ring is for the moon. And they interlock and form a Mesoamerican <coughs> century. Um, this is the calendar. It's very accurate. 365 and a half days. All Mesoamerican civilizations will use this calendar until Spanish conquest. What happens to Monte Alban? We don't know. Very suddenly, very rapidly, during the European Dark Ages, they just collapse and they are done. Which brings us to Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is inland. Everything we've talked about has been near the coast. And Teotihuacan is going to rise to power in Mexico from 100 to 750 um, AD. Think of them as powerful during Ro the Roman Empire, 
the Han Dynasty of China, Byzantine Empire, and the spread of Islam. Right? So a lot of things are going on. Teotihuacan ends right around the time of Charlemagne um, and the Kingdom of Ghana. Um, so there's your you know, cross-cultural um, happenings. They were located very um, near modern-day Mexico City. They are the, one of the few to, or the first to demonstrate this strong authoritarian central government. They've got a knowledge of complex mathematics, and they're highly organized because they build a city that is perfectly north and south and east and west into a grid pattern. The two central roads will empty out into a giant plaza or square with governmental buildings on one side and religious buildings on the other. It was a major, major capital city. You guys are right and fast. Everybody good? Awesome. All right. Now, the amazing thing about Teotihuacan is entering the city from the south, you go along the three-mile-long avenue of the dead. This is their big monumental architecture where there's big spooky faces and animals put in these big walls. And buried inside of them are high priests and nobles. Um, it is the Egyptian Valley of the Kings Mesoamerican style. And at the end is the biggest pyramid, one of the biggest pyramids in Mesoamerica, the 210 foot tall Pyramid of the Sun. Now while it's only half the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, it's still pretty big. It's a 21 story building and it was coated in gold. Directly opposite it is the, is the 120 foot, 110 foot Pyramid of the Sun. Um, decorated in all silver. Now, Teotihuacan was the center of major trade routes. Um, anybody who was anybody could, could come in there, but there was a separate marketplace for foreigners. If you lived in Teotihuacan, you could go anywhere, but foreign merchants were segregated. They were locked in a small area, and people could come to them, but they could not go out and interact with others. Zach? So it's like Canton in China or Kojima in Japan. Exactly. Exactly. Any, you know, if you're local, you can get in and interact, but if you're a foreigner, you stay where you are. And the city grows big. And as they do so, they push Kate off of her farmland, and Zach off of his, and Aaron off of his and Brett and Daniel and Michael, and then they said, wait a minute, what are we doing? If we keep displacing our own people, we're going to run out of food. So they stopped expanding, and they went 10, 15, 20 miles outside of it, and then they built a smaller version of themselves, very similar to ancient Rome. When population maxed out, they would go and build a different, smaller city kind of the make the world Rome policy. So, um, just like everybody else, everybody here is polytheistic. And when it comes to Teotihuacan, other groups kind of use them as their role model. Like, this is how we are going to build our civilization. This is the right way um, to do things. Once again, when things got really bad, the nobles would sacrifice their own blood or even kill themselves to appease the gods. And Teotihuacan is a massively powerful city. We have absolutely no idea why they suddenly collapsed. There was a big fire in what we can determine as the year 700, but the city recovered but it never again had the dominance and prominence that it once did. Everybody good there? Yes? Okay, right. 
Boom. Ah. Now, this is going to bring us to the Mayas, and we'll get some color in here. It's Maya. And the, yeah. So, everybody else we talked about were up along the um, coast, along the Gulf Coast, Teotihuacan inland. Well, the Mayas are going to be here in the Yucatan Peninsula. If you guys have gone on a cruise and got off in like Cozumel or whatever, well, this is this area. It's kind of rainforesty jungle, and it goes down from Mexico to like Guatemala, Honduras, part of Belize, and it's jungle. You can see right here, here is a Mayan city that's almost closed in by the jungle, and you couldn't tell it was there unless you flew right over it. Um, this is the story of the young 16-year-old Canadian girl who found the city. You guys remember that? All right, good. All right. So here it is. Um, several big city-states, very similar to ancient Greece or the kingdom of Mali, where we got several powerful cities. Chichen Itza, Tikal, Polonique, Tulum, places um, like that. Each, so here's the Mayas, and this purple area here, is going to be like Teotihuacan, Tenochtitlan, and over here is like the Olmecs and Monte Alban. Oh, I forgot to tell you about the Olmecs. They have this big, giant, massive heads and faces that look like they belong on Easter Island, but we're going to move on. Each city-state looks roughly the same, kind of like the outline of ancient Greek city-states. Temples, palaces, very intricate, handcrafted stonework. And each Mayan city-state was ruled by a god-king, a person that was worshipped like a living god. And they were used mainly as centers for religious ceremonies. There were about 39 or 40 of these Mayan city-states. Sometimes they traded, and sometimes they went to war normally over resources. However, each 39 city-state um, government was run by a single dynasty. So there were 39 different families, and those families were never overthrown, kind of like Japan. That makes sense? All right. So anyway. um, city-states were allied. They traded things like salt, like jade, like cocoa beans, and cotton. Um, the Mayans didn't have currency, so they kind of bartered and traded with everybody. But one of the things the Mayas are going to come up with and will eventually be dispersed around the world is beans, corn or maize, and squash. And after the AP exam, I will tell you guys what my number one thing was. Is it the printing press? Is it corn? Or is it the Silk Road? Corn, extremely important, and beans. Two crops that are high in protein and can be prepared many different ways so it doesn't feel like you're eating the same thing all the time. And these foods will be introduced during the transatlantic trade over into Africa causing a massive population boom. All right, here we've got the um, tallest um, pyramid here in Tikal at 212 feet. There it is, it's very nice, that's the pyramid. There's another pyramid, we slap your butt on here, we sacrifice you, your blood runs into these little like messages to the gods, we tip the table over and the gods are happy. Let's try not to do that. Here's the most famous one at Chichen Itza. It's really big and pretty. We also play the sacrificial ball game for the hero twins so they can go down and help fight the gods of the underworld. Okay, you guys got a few minute break? All right, great. Awesome. My religion, super complex. Um, there was no separation between the earthly world and the heavenly one. Um, the gods influence everything. It affects all social and political life. So it's like the Mesoamerican version of the um, Sharia. 
Church and state are integrated. There are no separation. The king was a living God. And the Mayas are going to be very, very, very technologically advanced. They are among, again, with no cultural diffusion, among the first in the world to use the concept of the zero. They have a calendar known as the long count, which is interesting. It was tied to like a, a point of origin way in the past. And when the Spanish conquistadors take over, once we understood where that fixed point in the past was, we were able to match up events that went on in Mesoamerica with what was going on over in Europe, gives us a greater understanding of what was going on, which is important because Mayan, the Mayans wrote, but we are still not able to understand their language. We cannot read it to this very day. Sierra, are you going to make it? Take a nap, dude. You're good. You're good. All right. It's all right. Um, so anyway, I already told, oh, but two of the city-states were run by women, which is something that you don't often see. All right, so that's the Mayas, guys. Who's next? So let's kick some Aztecs. All right. Social classes are always the same. King, royal family, priests, nobles, merchants, and artisans. Oh, also, the more colorful your garb, the more powerful of the <coughs> noble that you were. Excuse me. Um, ah, we got that. Oh, yes, blood dead. Okay, we did that. Oh, yes, forgot about this. The Mayas were extremely good at mathematics. They were able to form a, a calendar almost identical to our own. Um, instead of 365 and a half days, it's about 365 um, and a quarter. So it's very similar to our own with the leap year. And they understood the golden ratio or the gold mean of 1 to 1.618. And if you look at all ancient buildings from the Egyptian pyramids to Chichen Itza to the pitch of the Parthenon, even to the perspective from the center of Mona Lisa's smile to the background in the back. Everybody uses the golden ratio in construction and three-dimensional perspective. Um, architects use it. It's a very, very sophisticated thing to understand, and clearly the Mayans got it as there is one of their big pyramids. So once again, without cultural diffusion, they're doing the same, same stuff. All right. Um, there is their calendar made famous by Jack Sparrow and the pieces of eight. Um, they've got a 260-day lunar calendar and a 365-day solar calendar. They interlock and form the infinity symbol so all those bozos in 2012 were freaking out, it's the end of the world. I'm like, dude, it's an infinity symbol, get over it. So, here's their writing system. Um, they have glyphs in this little um, codex. Um, however, only recently have we been able to understand some of it because the part of the Rosetta Stone was found by those grave robbers. All this we know, yes? All right. Late 8900s, right about the time of Charlemagne and the Treaty of Verdun, the kingdoms of West Africa, the Mayas are going to slowly fade away. The cities were abandoned. Um, the people disappeared. We know they traded up and down the Gulf Coast, um, but they just slowly began to vanish, and we still don't know why. Some people say it was increased warfare, it was competition for resources, um, 
The, the answer is we really don't know. So by the time the Spanish showed up, the few remaining Mayans were so weak, they succumbed to European diseases, and they all died. Um, it's a good thing they didn't run into these guys. Have you guys ever seen Zach on the drum line? When he really gets rocking, he kind of looks like this guy. They call him the Adam making that up, Zach. But anyway, it'd be cool if you had that costume. We would yell, hey, Zach, kick some Aztec. Aztec. And it would be awesome. I couldn't even get into any trouble. It would be really cool. Um, Aztecs, 1200 to 1400. So a very short reign of power. Um, they really just get their start um, right before the Europeans show up. So we're thinking of the Renaissance, Prince Henry's School of Navigation, and Genghis Khan, the Mongol conquest over in Asia, 12 to 1400. This is what is um, going on. Or Songhai over in um, Africa. The Aztecs were nomadic warriors. They were thugs. They were really, really good at it. Much like ancient Sparta, they did not have a standing army because every male in the society trained for war. It's what they did. Aztec society was geared around the military. They served as the warrior arm of the mighty Toltecs before deciding to run things themselves. Very similar to what the Seljuks did to the Mamluks in the Ottoman Empire. Nobles were military officers and peasants were frontline foot soldiers. Their goal, think of the Aztecs as the Romans of Mesoamerica, to acquire territory and get resources, to be extractive. They're going to stick a straw <laughs> into your economic marrow and suck it out like a dementor. They want resources and they want them now. They also had a thirst for sacrificial victims. Nobody practices human sacrifice on a scale like the Aztecs. Right? They believe that blood powered the sun. So in battle, they didn't want to kill you. They wanted to wound you so you could be sacrificed. Here are some of the things that they took from cultures Two million cloaks, 7,000 tons of corn. They left you just enough to survive, and the rest they took back with them. Your status as a warrior was interesting. They are. This is a chart of all the tribute that they extracted. Your, um, the social class was open. You could climb in social class, based on your skill in battle. Um, besides being, being bloodthirsty warriors, one of their great achievements is the magnificent city of Tenochtitlan, right here in the Valley of Mexico, in Lake Texacoco, um, a giant Venice connected by bridges and causeways. Um, over in the central marketplace, over in here, 60 thousand people went there every single day. It was like a giant Super Target or Sam's Club or Costco, right? Food, clothing, medicine, um, housewares, you name it, you could get it in this magnificent floating city um, in central Mexico. Um, there's another map of it. It was so awesome after the conquistadors made this map, they said, man, we've got nothing like that. Not even Sevilla and Cadiz are that awesome back in Spain. Hey, guys, why don't we go? Brilliant. Let's go. So they do. Um, the religion was um, polytheistic, the gods of nature, the main god, um, as always being um, the god of the sun, just like in Japan just like Louis XIV and in Egypt. Um, the Aztecs believed if they did not, come on in, 
that the legendary Mr. Edwards, it is. What's going on, Mr. Edwards? All right. Um, the Aztecs believed if they did not sacrifice a certain number of victims, the sun would not come up the next day. This is where I'd like to go back and say, hey, fellas, I bet if we don't sacrifice anybody today, the sun will come up. But anyway, Sierra, have you ever done any? Have you ever been like Orphan Annie and the sun will come up tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow? yeah, I know that All right, anyway, so. Um, it is believed, as we showed you, that in times of dire crisis, the Aztecs were believed to have sacrificed 20 to 30,000 victims in one day with the razor sharp obsidian knife and tomahawk, and we believe they actually did it. Now, the Aztecs were very smart. They would go to Swanacanville. And they would capture all the young men, say 15 to 30, take them back and sacrifice them. Then they would go over to Phoebe Land and grab all the dudes, 15 to 30. Then they would come over here and they would capture Daniel's territory and get all the dudes, 15 to 30. And then move on to Kate. By the time they finished capturing captives from Kate, it would be 10 or 15 years and all the young boys in Swanacampville were now ready to be... Sacrifice. They couldn't just conquer everything because they would run out of sacrificial victims. So they had to make sure that worked. So anyway, obsidian knife, you rip a heart out in 20 to 30 seconds. So anyway, I guess it didn't hurt for very long. I don't know. Wait, they did it while they were alive? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can, you can't be dead. Not time for that. This thing's still got to be beating when you pull it out. And they just throw you off the side, like literally. See? Ah! Oh my god, there's my heart. Anyway, it's bad. Um, anyway, so uh, the Aztecs, again, are like Sparta. They're a combination of Rome and Sparta. They were very strict, they were very authoritarian and militaristic. Everything ran on a military chain of command. General, Colonel, Major, Captain, first lieutenant, second lieutenant. And the city only has two social classes. There was noble and there was commoner, very similar to ancient Rome when it was patrician and plebeian. A small, tiny, tiny little subset of merchants and artisans made up another um, social class. Um, uh, color was everything. The more brilliantly you're colored, um, the more powerful you are. So John and Hannah and Reed and Michael and Zach would be like big time, but us in like green or black, well, we would just be kind of like... Uh, and then Tejas and Daniel, kind of the blue and the white and the gray. Aaron with that t-shirt 50 style, you'd probably be okay anyway, but maybe not. Anyway, so anyhow, all right. Um, you could not um, if wear a uniform or a color that was not of your social class or you were strictly punished. But here's something interesting, something we see later on in the Ottoman Empire and later on in Tokugawa, Japan. Punishments were harsher on nobles than on the commoners. Because the noble is supposed to know better. I have given you a position of power. I have given you authority. But with great power comes great responsibility. So if you screw up and you know better, I'm going to drop the hammer on you because you are supposed to know better. Big Melanie goes out. She tells Brett, make sure your little brothers and sisters do what they're supposed to do. She comes home. The dishwasher's not unloaded, the plants are all over the floor, the dog got loose, they've ripped the turkey off the table like the bumpus is, and Brent was upstairs doing his AP Road homework. He has no idea that this went on. Who does mom yell at? Brent. Why? He's the oldest and he's supposed to. Did you see it's his own fault? I said because he's in charge. Because he's in charge. Brett, you're the oldest. You're supposed to know better. 
Why did you leave Michael and Aaron in charge? Dear God, man. What the heck? Where's Popkin? Anyway. So anyhow, there it is. Neighborhoods were divided into little things known as Kapuli. Think of New York City at the height of immigration. Here's the Polish neighborhood, the Italian neighborhood, the Jewish neighborhood. Did I say Italian? Yeah. yeah. Irish, Italian, Jewish, okay, there's neighborhoods. All right, pick your ethnic group, there is a neighborhood. You went to school there, you worshiped there, you went to the stores there, that was your world, all right? My in-laws, it was um, 106th to Western Avenue in Chicago. It's where they did, it's where they did everything. It's kind of like your neighborhood, neighborhoods. Um, uh, what do we got? Lake Hogan, Wexford, um, from McLaughlin, we got Wayne's Woods, WW. Um, we've got Highlands, Claremont, um, Windchime, Windsock. What's that, Tejas? Windmore. Windmore. So we are going to win more. Windmore, Homestead Village, and that is your Kapuli. Your taxes are paid by Kapuli. You go to school in Winmore. You go to school in Lake Hogan. Um, and it was very um, competitive. Your life revolved around that community. It's where you trained for your battle. It's where everything took place. Um, women in Aztec society had a high place based on the amount of children that they had. So if you're like that crazy woman from Alabama, like 22 and eternally pregnant, she would be big medicine. Was it Mrs. Duggar? Was it Duggar? All right. More kids you have um, going through childbirth is like the pains of combat. Aztec society reaches its high point just as Hernando Cortez and the conquistadors roll in to town. And they are defeated in 1519. Any questions on the Aztecs? Boy, we went through that so fast, it's like we kicked some Aztec. Thank you. Ah. I'm, I'm looking at you guys, we're starting to fade. Phoebe. Can you go to the last slide? Yes, ma'am. Um, Emily, you hanging in there? I'm hanging. Give us some words of Emily inspiration. Some Emily inspiration? Mm -hmm. um, if we all take notes, I'll bake y'all cookies. Wait, what? Ah, I just, I need to be like, come on. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Emily can oh, bake. Oh, I thought you were like a bribe. Emily can bake, so anyway. Oh, y'all can do it. Can you we bring got in, this. We got this. Can you still have it? All right. Sparrow? I don't know. Let me know when you're ready, Phoebe. If it's. I'm done. All right, Zach, you good? If I get home, Kate, you strong? You got this? All right. All right. The Incan Empire is going to grow simultaneously with the Aztecs. We're going to move down into South America along the West Coast. Peru, Ecuador, Chile, kind of the era that, or the area that our boy Jose de San Martin um, wandered into um, a little bit later on. Um, Mex the Spanish will go to Mexico for gold. They will find silver here in another great and mighty, powerful civilization in South America. Again, 12 to 1500, reaching their high point around 14, just like the Aztecs. End of the Crusades, Renaissance, Age of Exploration, Mali, Songhai, and the Mongol Empire over in China. Um, the foundational civilizations like the Olmecs of South America are the Mokcha and the <clears throat> Nazca people. And they are going to form this very long civilization that's more vertical than it is horizontal, running down the coastline of South America. Wildly diverse terrain. Ready, ready? Great. Here are the famous Nazca lines um, on the cliff sides. We've got the spider, we've got a spider monkey, 
we got this thing that looks like a giant hand flipping somebody off or a big <laughs> or a big like bird. Um, you can only see them from the air. Maybe that'll help you out a little bit. Leading many people to believe like there were aliens and all this happy stuff. Okay. Much of um, <coughs> the Incan Empire is going to be high in the rough Andes Mountains. Very rough terrain volcanic soil, and it's way up in the air. It's 10, 11,000 feet high. So if you go to visit, you have to, some people have to acclimatize, or you get altitude sickness. The air is very, very, very thin. And up here, the Inca is believed to have started around Lake Titicaca, um, which means pouncing leopard. And they had to live down here in these valleys surrounded by mountains. If there was a landslide or something bad happened, the people were in bad shape. I am really impressed that when I said caca, nobody was like, ooh, ooh. So hey, you guys are almost, oh, John's laughing, yeah. All right. You guys are almost maturing. Or Michael laughed too? No. No. All right. <laughs> Okay, so anyhow, all right. Um, the early Incas um, will um, start in the valley of Cusco, which means four quarters. And it is this broad, flat plain that will intersect north and south and east-western trade routes. And their, you guys are going to laugh, their famous king is Pachacuti. And Pachacuti will win this war when his dad and his brother punked out. And Pachacuti rallies his people into combat and he wins. And they believe that he's blessed um, as a god. So he becomes a god king emperor. And he will build the city of Cusco and conquer neighboring lands and then put his son on the throne. And he goes back to Cusco and kind of sets up the Incan government system. So he's there. It's kind of like when Alexander the Great let you know, um, you know his you know Tiberius start to rule, and Alexander the, or Alexander the Great, Augustus Caesar was always there if you needed help. So there was a smooth transition of power. By 1500, the Incan Empire is 2,500 miles long and has a population of 16 million people. This thing was huge. It incorporated, you know, geographic diversity, language diversity. And Incan is the imposed language. When the Incans conquered you, you had to learn to speak Incan. Very similar to the Muslims, when they conquered a territory, you had to learn Arabic. When it was necessary, the um, Incans um, would use military force. Whoops, I boxed myself in over here. But what they were very, very, very good at was using and building diplomacy for alliances. If you, they conquered you, more often than not, you were able to keep your own um, customs, your own government in charge. To the Incas, um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So they will spend a lot of time building roads through the mountains. Um, across, I was just hoping this guy well, here wasn't going to fall off. They build an intricate road network linking their empire for trade, for communication, and for the military. What they would do is, I would go up to Alexi here, and say, Alexi, we're powerful, we're Incans, you want to assimilate into our empire. And you would say, no. All right. Alexi's easy. She's like, yeah, okay. So now we got Alexi. Jesse, we're going to move on to you. You want to assimilate into our empire. No. Are you sure? All right. We would then build a big warehouse, fill it full of all of our stuff, Food, clothes, five-gallon jars of jip peanut butter, housewares, TVs, and say, Jesse, go through and walk through 
and help yourself to anything. When you're done, are you sure you don't want to join us? All right, well, then now we're just going to militarily conquer you. All right, we're going to ask you. We're going to try and entice you. If that doesn't work, the hammer will fall. Jesse, I'm sorry. You're going to join our empire, and you're going to have to like it. All right. So the government is going to control all facets of not only their um, citizens' lives, but the people that they conquer. And they set up a taxation or a labor system known simply as the Mita system. Whoa! What? I'm losing things. My Enzio Beach said, ah, oh, here it is. Alright, so anyhow, um, everybody had to pay um, a tax. All able-bodied assistants have to work for 40 days a year. You do your normal job, whether you're a farmer or an artisan or whatever it is, and for 40 days you work for the government. Maybe you're building the intricate road network. Maybe you are advising the emperor. You're doing whatever, um, but you do your 40 days. Kate knows that in January, she's working. Aaron's in February. Michael is in March. You know when it's coming. 11 months a year, you do your job. For one month, you work for the government on whatever they needed you to do. It was fair, it was consistent, and everybody had to do it. So... Their technological achievements, this 14,000 mile road system, um, they had a postal service, they invented rope suspension bridges to cross valleys or rivers so it could be safe to travel from place to place. A government job was a chotsky, like a cross country runner, and they traveled five to eight miles on this road system. They had a little basket of like food and water, they had a little stick to keep them safe. When they got close, they got out of a big conch horn, they blew the um, horn, and the other runner would start loosening up, and they would run in like a, like a relay race and track, they would deliver the message, and off the runner would go. They did this day and night. It was a governmental job um, that interlock, interlinked the entire empire, like the Roman roads, like the Great Royal Road, they could cover the whole thing in just five days. Because they live in the mountains, um, growing crops is very important. So they began to carve into the mountainside these terraces to prevent the soil and the seeds from eroding. They even dug these giant like drain or toilet bowl, so the stuff that does run off, it collects down here in the bottom, and it can still grow. Nothing goes to waste. It was a way to maximize the land that you could farm in mountainous areas. The Mayas also did this, as did the Kingdom of Axum we talked about the other day. Um, the Incas will never develop a writing system. So everything had to be memorized. Um, they did have like an Incan style abacus known as a kipu, where they use different type of knots and different colored beads to record information. If you remember, I think I gave you the example. A yellow bead is the sun. Then they did a green and a blue. A second green and blue, third green and blue, and then another sun. Or no, wait a minute. A green, I just messed up my own analogy. You get it, they traveled a, a green bead, a blue, a yellow, a blue, a yellow, a blue, a yellow, and another green, which means they left land, they traveled for three days over water, and they got back to land again. There, I finally got it. So, um, anyway, um, they were extremely polytheistic just like everybody else. And the Aztec, or the Incas believed that their ruler was a descendant of Inti, the sun god, 
exactly like the ancient Aztecs. And they sacrificed food and sometimes animal. And every now and then, if things got bad, they also sacrificed people. Um, what's strange is that they had mummies, some of which are said to be older than Egyptian mummies, which I find hard to believe since were they even there when Egypt was a civilization. But one thing the Incas do, they leave the mummies as if they were still alive. Servants bring them food. They're taken from one place to another so they can sit and hang out and talk to each other. There's a big religious festival. They put the mummies on their shoulders and they go out and, you know, they do, I don't even know, it's pretty crazy. Um, anyway, so um, they kind of hang out with each other and you emo, tap, anyway. So anyhow, um, Temple of the Sun, not much is left of it. Just this little bit was one of the main temples coated with gold and silver. When Francisco Pizarro saw it, he was like, my God, this is awesome. Right next to it is the great Potessi silver mine, which 80% of the world's wealth was ripped out of there as Pizarro begins to take over. We found the great city of Machu Picchu in 1912, and you can see it's built high in the Andes. Part of it is on a sheer cliff. Here's the map over here behind Aaron. Um, it is a world heritage site to this very day. And remember that there were no large beasts of burden. All of this was done by pure human massive labor. Um, the civilization will come to an end in 1532. There was a civil war between the brothers Huskar and Aflupa. And you may remember I told you Aflupa was locked in the, in the room for three days and more and more and more and more warriors showed up and Pizarro says, come out here and wave to your fellas and they waved to the fellows and all the warriors dispersed and they killed with Lupa and took all of his money. And with that, it's the end of the Incan um, Empire. Um, it will switch now to the age of colonization and the transatlantic trade or the Colombian exchange. So in 55 minutes... We have just crushed Mesoamerica. Does anybody have any questions? You guys look. I feel bad looking at Phoebe and Sierra. They're dead setting. Any questions? You guys good? Nobody wants to push on and do transatlantic trade? I got a game. No? All right. Joe, you got a game and you were here. Cut it off.